Hi and welcome back. In this second half of my interview with Professor Klaus Wirth, we discuss what needs to happen to make the implications of this important research more widely known, what he thinks of viral persistence and whether it could be part of this puzzle, and the news about the new drug MDC002, or Metodicure, which has been designed specifically to counter the mitochondrial madness that we now know is wreaking havoc in our bodies. I hope you find it interesting. What do we need to do to get wider recognition of this pathology in the medical community like it feels like it's at the moment it's there's only a few people in the medical community who seem to be aware of this sort of fundamental building blocks of the disease in a sense this is the engine that drives the disease but it doesn't seem to be that widely understood what do we need to do to change that we have to show the objective data and these are hyper the cerebral hyperperfusion, particularly upon uh, in the upright position and the sitting position. So there's very strong orthostatic dysfunction and uh, low cerebral blood flows, which can explain the cognitive symptoms together with uh, with the hyperstimulation of the brain. There's hypervigilance, there's hyperstimulation, there's high sympathetic tone, probably also because due uh, to outer antibodies. And uh, the other objective finding are the skeletal muscle findings uh, for Particularly the uh, the the C PET studies, the ergometer studies, which show objectively anaerobic metabolism early on uh, during exercise, very objective. I mean, this is so clear. I mean, if your skeletal muscle mitochondria don't work properly, you have no energy. You can survive; it doesn't cause infarction, but you cannot live a normal life because you need your muscles for every movement. Movement, and this doesn't work. So there is a lot. There is no energy or low energy in the skeletal muscle. And there is low energy in the brain, but the brain is hyper-stimulated. So there's a mismatch between the stimulation, the overstimulation, which would require lots of energy, much more energy, but there is much less energy due to hyperperfusion. And this causes then chaos in the brain. Is it fair to, to think that we, we've looked at what's happening in the skeletal muscle in terms of the, um, the cellular metabolism there? But is it fair to assume that the cells throughout the body and our various organs are also malfunctioning similarly in terms of their ability to respire correctly, metabolize correctly and the mitochondria to function, whether it's in our gut or in our lungs or in our heart tissue or, or, or indeed anywhere else? I don't really believe it. Maybe a little bit, but the brain and skeletal muscle, they require a lot more energy during effort. Skeletal muscle perfusion can rise 30 fold during exercise. And in the brain, there is also a strong need for a strong rise in perfusion during mental activity. And in the heart, it's similar, but the heart uh, only can increase perfusion by fourfold. And that's already a lot. So for skeletal muscle, it, it's 30 fold. So this tells us about the energy situation it needs a lot more energy. And also the sodium pump requires 10 to 20 fold stimulation during exercise. One has to imagine this 10 to 20 fold uh, stimulation and this is not possible with all the limitations, beta 2 dysfunction, TRPM3 dysfunction, small nerve, nerve fiber dysfunction, inhibition by ROS, low energy, low ATP after establishment of mitochondrial dysfunction. So I don't, don't think this is um, other organs are affected in, in, this, in the same way I mean, there is probably renal hyperperfusion and uh, so the, uh, a loss of sodium and water, uh, like with a, uh, with a mild salivary diuretic for several reasons. And uh, the cardiac function is also uh, diminished by the preload. And in the long term, there is a finding of small hearts because stroke volume is low and the heart adapts. Is hyper, can call it hypertrophy. So there are ch there are changes. There are many organs affected, but I think the main organs. Uh, the brain and, and the skeletal muscle. And of course, the, our immunological system that produces these, these antibodies, older antibodies. Where do you see viral persistence fitting, or the idea of viral persistence fitting into this puzzle? Yeah, viral persistence could stimulate uh, antibody production. And But in, in, in the new study, in German study, epilogue study, viral persistence has not been found. So the question is, does it really exist? It may be present in the beginning, but I think it, it's not present. Perhaps viral reactivation of the Epstein-Barr virus that is, could occur from time to time and renew autoantibody titers and antibody production. Let's talk a little bit about MDC002. 
Uh, can you tell us what it is and how it works in a nutshell? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it stimulates the the the, the sodium pump uh, and and also a mitochondrial calcium exchanger to keep calcium low in the mitochondria. So it's a very particular mechanism, uh, and additionally uh, an independent effect that it it raises cerebral blood flow and skeletal muscle blood flow. So the main effect is the stimulation of the sodium pump and the, the yeah the prevention of uh, mitochondrial calcium overload. The second is the, the improvement of, of perfusion, particular in the brain and in the heart, uh, brain and in skeletal muscle. And there is also a slight uh, analgesic effect, or effect against pain and also a mild effect against edema, which means that the, the vessels don't get leaky and keep the volume uh, in the vessel for, for a good preload of the heart. No? So could you describe where we're at now in terms of the drug's lifespan, in terms of what stage we're at in terms of trials, what needs to happen next? And for anybody watching this who thinks this sounds fantastic, are we talking, like, how long might it be before there's a chance they could actually take it? Yeah, it takes a, a very long okay. time. This yeah. is very disappointing for patients, but this is what drug research is. I mean... We are at least two years away from from the first clinical testing at all, and then there is always five, six years needed for for getting to the market. So it, it's a long way. But if we don't start, we never get to to, to a drug. Yeah. So we have to start, and uh, I hope by being well financed, we can accelerate it a little bit by doing work in parallel. What do you think? This is the final question. Um, what do you think is the next most, apart from the trials of MDC002, what do you think is the next most important piece of research that needs to happen to start to crack open the next part of this jigsaw puzzle that is understanding long COVID and MECFS? I think we need investigations in the severely ill patients and also mitochondrial biopsies to, to, to see what the state of the mitochondria is. Normally, in other diseases, we get our recognition from the most severe cases because the changes are very strong and clear. But here we, we have no have, have no uh, data from from the severely ill. We could probably learn a lot from from if we had data from from severe ill, Ill patients. I've just thought of another question. Very sorry. Um, I wanted to ask: in the absence of being able to take something like MDC002 that affects the function of the sodium pump and the way that the calcium is uh, built up and everything else. Is there anything that patients could do in terms of activity, in terms of management, in terms of anything that they could eat or do that would help assist the body in trying to do the right thing and get out of this sort of vicious cycle? Is there anything that could even make a 5% difference in terms of behavior or what they eat or the sorts of things they do with their body that, given what we know about what's happening, that might help? Well, you know, pacing is effective to avoid these. Uh, <laughs> PEM for us is the renewal of the damage. Yeah. So we have to avoid uh, avoid uh, uh, the, the uh, PEM. Uh, and I... In the last three months, I thought a lot about the severely ill patient and what one could do before we have our, our compound. But it's really too early to communicate these, these ideas. Thank you so much for your time today, Professor Worth. It's been an absolute pleasure. I wish you the best in your ongoing research. I think it's unbelievably important. Yeah, I thank you. Hmm? Yeah. Now, I know that your first feeling upon watching this is probably, OMG, WTF, why do trials have to take so effing long? Well, I share your pain, but this is the nature of science done well, and there is a limit to how much we can speed it up, unless we persuade the right people to throw millions upon millions at the problem. And whilst there are so many competing theories and lack of unity, even just in understanding the phenotyping of long COVID, let alone the pathology, we've still got some way to go. In my next video, I'm going to be talking about why my BMI has plunged so dramatically and I look like I've been drinking people's blood and scared of garlic. But on the plus side, I intend to audition for Skeletor in the new He-Man movie, so there's that. And of course, the fact that I do actually feel quite a lot better. So I'm going to be going into the hows, whys and wherefores of what my experiences have been over the last few months. Look after yourselves. Until next time.